Hi, friends. I'm Annie F. Downs. Let's read the Gospels. The Gospels are the first four books of the New Testament in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the stories of Jesus Christ's life on earth, the friendships, the parables, the sacrifices, the meals, and the miracles. So each month we read all four books in 30 days. If you're jumping in with us today as we start the book of John, welcome, welcome. This is the last of the four books for this month, but on September 1, we will start all over again. It is so fun. So here's how it works. I'll read three chapters to you today. You can listen or read along in your own Bible, and then I'll pray, and that's it. So today is August 24th, day 24, and I'll be reading John chapters 1 through 3. And this month, I'm reading from the message. John 1. The Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing came into being without him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness. The darkness couldn't put it out. There once was a man, his name John, sent by God to point out the way to the life light. He came to show everyone where to look, who to believe in. John was not himself the light. He was there to show the way to the light. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life, he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him, and yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, who believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God's selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten, The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, this is the one, the one I told you was coming after me, but in fact was ahead of me. He has always been ahead of me. He always had the first word. We all live off his generous abundance, gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses, and then this exuberant giving and receiving, this endless knowing and understanding, all this came through Jesus, the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse. This one-of-a-kind God expression, who exists at the very heart of the Father, has made him plain as day. When Jews from Jerusalem sent a group of priests and officials to ask John who he was, he was completely honest. He didn't evade the question. He told the plain truth, I am not the Messiah. They pressed him, who then, Elijah? I am not. The prophet? No. Exasperated, they said, who then? We need an answer for those who sent us. Tell us something, anything about yourself. I'm thunder in the desert. Make the road straight for God. I'm doing what the prophet Isaiah preached. Those sent to question him were from the Pharisee party. Now they had a question of their own. If you're neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, why do you baptize? John answered, I only baptize using water. A person you don't recognize has taken his stand in your midst. He comes after me, but he is not in second place to me. I'm not even worthy to hold his coat for him. These conversations took place in Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing at the time. The very next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and yelled out, Here he is, God's Passover lamb. He forgives the sins of the world. This is the man I've been talking about, the one who comes after me but is really ahead of me. I knew nothing about who he was, only this, that my task has been to get Israel ready to recognize him as the God revealer. That is why I came here baptizing with water, giving you a good bath and scrubbing sins from your life so you can get a fresh start with God. John clenched his witness with this. I watched the spirit like a dove flying down out of the sky, making himself at home in him. I repeat, I know nothing about him except this. The one who authorized me to baptize with water told me, the one on whom you see the spirit come down and stay, this one will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I saw happen. And I'm telling you, there's no question about it. This is the son of God. The next day, John was back at his post with two disciples who were watching. He looked up, saw Jesus walking nearby and said, here he is, God's Passover lamb. The two disciples heard him and went after Jesus. Jesus looked over his shoulder and said to them, what are you after? They said, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? 
He replied, come along and see for yourself. They came, saw where he was living, and ended up staying with him for the day. It was late afternoon when this happened. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John's witness and followed Jesus. The first thing he did after finding where Jesus lived was find his own brother, Simon, telling him, we found the Messiah, that is Christ. He immediately led him to Jesus. Jesus took one look up and said, you're John's son, Simon. From now on, your name is Cephas, or Peter, which means rock. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When he got there, he ran across Philip and said, come, follow me. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Philip went and found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote of in the law, the one preached by the prophets. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathanael said, Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. But Philip said, Come, see for yourself. When Jesus saw him coming, he said, There's a real Israelite, not a false bone in his body. Nathanael said, Where did you get that idea? You don't know me. Jesus answered, One day, long before Philip called you here, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus said, You've become a believer simply because I say I saw you one day sitting under the fig tree? You haven't seen anything yet. Before this is over, you're going to see heaven open and God's angels descending to the Son of Man and ascending again. John 2 Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him, they're just about out of wine. Jesus said, is that any of our business, mother? Yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. Six stoneware water pots were there, used by the Jews for ritual washings. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom, Everybody I know begins with their finest wines, and after the guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff, but you've saved the best till now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum along with his mother, brothers, and disciples and stayed several days. When the Passover feast, celebrated each spring by the Jews, was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple teeming with people selling cattle and sheep and doves. The loan sharks were also there in full strength. Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and cattle, upending the tables of the loan sharks, spilling coins left and right. He told the dove merchants, Get your things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a shopping mall. That's when his disciples remembered the scripture, Zeal for your house consumes me. But the Jews were upset. They asked, What credentials can you present to justify this? Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days, I'll put it back together. They were indignant. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? But Jesus was talking about his body as the temple. Later, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this. Then they put two and two together and believed both what was written in Scripture and what Jesus had said. During the time he was in Jerusalem, those days of the Passover feast, many people noticed the signs he was displaying and, seeing they pointed straight to God, entrusted their lives to him. But Jesus didn't entrust his life to them. He knew them inside and out, knew how untrustworthy they were. He didn't need any help in seeing right through them. John 3. There was a man of the Pharisee sect, Nicodemus, a prominent leader among the Jews. Late one night, he visited Jesus and said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. No one could do all the God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in on it. Jesus said, you're absolutely right. Take it from me, unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see what I'm pointing to, to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, be born who has already been born and grown up? You can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying with this born-from-above talk? Jesus said, you're not listening. Let me say it again. 
Unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. When you look at a baby, it's just that, a body you can look at and touch. But the person who takes shape within is formed by something you can't see and touch, the spirit, and becomes a living spirit. So don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have to be born from above, out of this world, so to speak. You know well enough how the wind blows this way and that. You hear it rustling through the trees, but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next. That's the way it is with everyone born from above, by the wind of God, the Spirit of God. Nicodemus asked, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? Jesus said, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober truth to you. I speak only of what I know by experience. I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. There is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay. Yet, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. If I tell you things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you of things you can't see, the things of God? No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed— By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light so the work can be seen for the God work it is. After this conversation, Jesus went on with his disciples into the Judean countryside and relaxed with them there. He was also baptizing. At the same time, John was baptizing over at Anon near Salem, where water was abundant. This was before John was thrown into jail. John's disciples got into an argument with the establishment Jews over the nature of baptism. They came to John and said, Rabbi, you know the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you authorized with your witness? Well, he's now competing with us. He's baptizing too, and everyone's going to him instead of us. John answered, it's not possible for a person to succeed. I'm talking about eternal success without heaven's help. You yourselves were there when I made it public that I was not the Messiah, but simply the one sent ahead of him to get things ready. The one who gets the bride is, by definition, the bridegroom. And the bridegroom's friend, his best man, that's me, in place at his side where he can hear every word, is genuinely happy. How could he be jealous when he knows that the wedding is finished and the marriage is off to a good start? That's why my cup is running over. This is the assigned moment for him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. The one who comes from above is head and shoulders over other messengers from God. The earthborn is earthbound and speaks earth language. The heavenborn is in a league of his own. He sets out the evidence of what he saw and heard in heaven. No one wants to deal with these facts, but anyone who examines this evidence will come to stake his life on this, that God himself is the truth. And don't think he rations out the spirit in bits and pieces. The father loves the son extravagantly. He turned everything over to him so he could give it away, a lavish distribution of gifts. That is why whoever accepts and trusts the son gets in on everything life complete and forever. And that is also why the person who avoids and distrusts the sun is in the dark and doesn't see life. All he experiences of God is darkness and an angry darkness at that. That is John chapters one through three. Let's pray together. Jesus, I love the part in John two where you say that many people notice the signs 
that you were displaying, and they pointed straight to God, and people entrusted their lives to you. And so, God, in our lives, there are so many of us listening who, like, we want to believe, and we're trying to believe, but help our unbelief. I just ask that you would show some signs today in our lives, the kind of signs that help us to know that this is pointed straight to you, God, that and that we can entrust our lives to Jesus. We are looking for that today. We are looking for those kind of signs that will help us to see you. So our eyes are open. Our hearts are open. We are looking for you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.